one of the most common, if not the most common, objections to the notion of there even being a God, of there even being a creator, is suffering. It comes in many forms, many different questions. The most recent I was confronted with was someone said, there's 15,000 children every single day that starve to death, and your God does nothing about it. What do you have to say about that? Well, that that's a big statement, and assumed in there is that the person saying that knows what's best. They know that that is absolute evil, and the Creator lets absolute, or some sort of evil, maybe it's not absolute, but it's evil, and it's bad, and God needs to explain that. So that places that person in a position of judgment, and I can totally relate to that. I'm not patronizing anyone because I've been there. I was an atheist for many years, and I was in a, in a standpoint of judgment, as I should have been, rationally speaking, if there is no God, I should not trust anyone other than myself. If I don't trust myself, how could I even know who I should trust? I wouldn't make a good decision on who to trust. So obviously, I should trust myself, my own judgment, and my own view on things. But since then, I've come to believe that there is a Creator. And in that transition from atheism to believing there is a God, I went through a lot of anger because I had to deal with the same issue of all this suffering. In the world, yes, but what really got me personally and caused me to rage against him was the suffering of those I love. Not so much mine, because I've, I've had a pretty blessed life. I haven't had a lot of suffering that, at least all of it, it was caused by myself. And I know of others that have suffered greatly. And I couldn't just explain that away and just say, well, he's God, he'll figure it out. I had to try to figure out what, what that all means. But it all kept, kept coming back to is I am the one who decides what is fair and just. I am the final arbiter on that. I know what is right, what is good, what should be. I have to take that position, which puts me back in atheism. And I'm not saying this as like, oh, just blind faith, you just got to accept God moves in mysterious ways. I don't like those answers. I, I think we should struggle with this. And when it comes to children, I am quite confident that God will make a just decision. Because there's people that sometimes I can be angry with and I might think they should go to the bad place. But God is much more merciful to, than, than I am. I can't even completely comprehend the mercy He has other than looking at my own life, which is pretty amazing, the mercy He showed me. And He has even more than that in store for the entire world. Because I haven't done the worst things, but I've done some pretty bad things. And yet, my God is merciful to me. And he's forgiven me, and he has not only offered, but now he has given me himself. He gave himself for me, so that he could give himself to me. Through my belief in that, through my belief in his goodness, the only good one. Yeah, he changes me, he cleans me up, but I'm still sitting. I'm not even going to say I sin less than someone who's in church, or my own self when I used to be in church, because that's not what it's about. Sin is just something that we can use to learn more about him. I'm not saying... I'm just crazy sinner, don't care if I sin or not. Of course I, I care, but I'm not focusing on my sin. Just like when he, he cleaned me up in certain things I was doing, I didn't focus on not doing those things, specifically smoking and drinking. I never focused on quitting. I don't even know when I stopped doing that. I know the year, but I don't even, I'm not even sure the months that I quit each one of those. I was, I was bringing my attention to my Creator, and He just took it away. What if only one quote-unquote innocent person died unjustly ever would, would God still be bad would he be a bad God if that happened if everyone else got treated fair and square and they only got justice and just this one person died unjustly according to the way you see things would that make him unjust would that invalidate him as a good God and creator well, I ask that, and I think a lot of Christians know where I'm going, because it says that in the, in the Scripture that none is good, no, not one. And until you understand that and you come to that reality, you realize there's no good people, that every single person, you know, from Hitler on up to whatever person you think is a good person, uh, they all need the mercy of God. And there's an example of Peter pointing at John in the Bible at the end of the book of John, saying, what about him? 
And Jesus says, don't worry about him. What's it to you if, if he remains until I come back? Just take care of yourself and, and get to know me. Be my sheep. Live your life. Trust me. And part of trusting him, if you really believe that he's a good guy, I mean, you have to make a decision. You can't be sitting there constantly calculating whether or not he's good in every single situation. At some point, you have to determine if he's good. And if so, you, you can then trust that he will make good decisions regarding everything. I mean, we are talking about the creator of the universe here. So if I trust in that one, then I can know he's going to make good decisions. And regarding that one innocent person, that did happen. The one innocent person that didn't deserve to die was God himself. When he came here as the man Christ Jesus, God the Father became a man. That is who the Son is. That's why in, in Colossians 1.13, it describes him as the Son of his love. That's the proper way that that is interpreted. He calls Jesus the Son of his love. In other words, his love was so powerful for us. It was so strong that he actually birthed himself into the world. That was God in the flesh. That was the God, the Ancient of Days, the one beside whom there is no other, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that in them is, was in that little baby and grew up into that man. That was all of God right there. He didn't show everything that he was, and he even chose not to know certain things. He even chose to learn things. That is God's prerogative. He can do that. But that good one, the creator, the only good one, subjected himself to our form of justice, which it is, all of us. All of us basically did that to him because even if you were there and you didn't want that to happen to him, still it was your sin that required him to do that. So that's why I say we're all in the same basket, whether it's Hitler or some holy person or some wonderful granny you know or something. We're all in the same, in the same basket of humanity in, in the fact that we all need his mercy. And think about this, no one, I mean no one, I, I've never seen any evidence that anyone was praying for, was travailing for, or hoping for, or pleading for, or setting up a religious committee for the purpose of getting God to come here as a human being so he could die for us. No one was asking for that. So that kind of shows how clueless we are. We are totally clueless about what we need and how to get it. So no one was asking for him to do what he did, and he just came here and did it. So it's understandable. We don't totally for, we don't totally understand it. I mean, I never. What's all this blood stuff and the cross? Oh my goodness! And but I had to seek it. I had to understand it. And there is something universal in the attraction or the repulsion. Is it repulsion? I'm not sure. Anyway, that that we feel when we hear the name of Jesus. That's something I think. Literally everyone feels something when they hear that name, if they know anything about him. Because even if you don't believe it, you know what he represents somewhere in your spirit. Because he said he poured out his spirit over all flesh. So that means all of us have access to his spirit. His spirit is everywhere. There's not a place where the Lord isn't. Now, if you reject them, you reject them. That's on you. But Paul was rejecting him in his own way. He knew Paul's heart, so he kept going after him. And finally... Finally, Paul responded. So, again, God will make a good decision. He knows if you're never going to turn to him, so then he can, still, he can still do things with you like he did with Pharaoh for his own glory. He doesn't make people do evil things. He just, he just knows if you're going to turn to him or not. That's why he saves people that, that are once saved, always saved. He doesn't go around saving people who then decide they don't really believe in him. And you're like, oh, snap. Now I've got to unsave them. No, you're not in and out of salvation because that would make God less than good. That good one gave his life for you and until you get in touch with that or at least consider that, you'll never find it out as long as you are standing in a position of judgment. These things happen. If there was a God, it wouldn't be like that. Well, you're putting yourself in place of God. That's what you're doing. Again, I'm not judging that. I did it more than half my life. For decades I did that. And if there is no God, you probably should because there's no one else you can trust better than yourself. You might as well trust yourself. But if you looked at things, which I think all of us should do at some point in time, 
and really consider, just consider the creation. Even before you think it's a creation, just consider the world. And if you really think about it rationally, you, you will find out there's a God. And you might even rage against Him like I did and be angry at Him. But just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and struggle with it. Go ahead and hate Him or whatever it is you feel you need to do. Because our God is there to, to be heard and He's there to hear. He will listen to you. But it's a matter of, of your heart. And only He knows your heart. I don't know your heart. You don't know mine. There's only one who knows your heart, and that's the one who made your heart. And he'll give you a new one if you'll come to him. But you got to be honest. you got to be true. Whatever it is, your doubts, your anger, your appreciation, your thankfulness, whatever it is, just, just give it to him. I mean, it's usually negative in the, in the beginning because we got all this judgment because that's what we do. That's what human beings do. He called the entire nation of Israel stiff-necked. That was their nature, and they were his people. That's the way we are, but we need, to, we need to struggle through that and just plow right through it. That's a bit of counseling here. That's what I've always done when it comes to what they call hard scriptures. If I believe something and this scripture seems to indicate something different than what I believe, I go straight at it. Not so I can twist it or do a spin doctor treatment on it, but so I can really see if it's true or not. And I, my faith is always increasing that. I don't ignore those or kick them to the curb or something so that I don't have to face them. I look at them even harder. And that's how I found all these things that we share here in these, these videos. There's revelation all over these videos that religious people can't see because it has to fit inside of their, their doctrines of men and their theology. We don't teach theology. We talk about a person here because that's what life is. Life is a person. Jesus who is our life. That's what it says in the Bible. He is our everything. He is our faith. He is our baptism. He is our kindness. He is our goodness. He is our love. He is our acceptance. Whatever you need that is of substance and value, that's who God is. But if you don't know that, it's okay. Seek, and you will find out. That is one thing I am confident of. If you seek with your heart, an honest heart, and you're willing to, to believe what you find, you will find Jesus. That's all there is to it. In Jesus' name.